Um, so, in a normal person, what is the drive for breathing? Is it oxygen or is it CO2? CO2. It is, which is hard to even fathom that CO2 is actually the driver for breathing. But like your video shown on Friday, if you were to hold your breath, you're building up CO2 levels the whole time you're holding your breath. So it's not that you want to go <gasps> taking another breath because your low. oxygen levels are low. It's not. It's because the CO2 levels keep building up. So you want to blow out and get rid of them. So CO2 levels are what drives us to breathe in a normal person. So that being said, with emphysema, where our lungs are overinflated, we have lots of air in there. We just can't get it out. So it would be like holding your breath. Their CO2 levels are chronically high. They're forever high for years. So what becomes their drive for breathing? Because just think about when we had an adaptation where smell adaptations where something smells good and then we don't smell it after a while because our brain says well you're not paying any attention to this stimulus i'm gonna quit giving it to you so the same thing happens with these guys with their co2 levels their co2 levels are always high they're always setting at 7.48 7.5 so or i'm sorry they're always setting at acidic they're always setting at 7.33 7. Three, they're always very acidic. So then the brain is like, okay, you're not doing anything. You're not breathing any faster. And it's because we can't, we physically can't. So they start responding to oxygen as the driver. So when they get up and get out of breath, their oxygen level drops. And if you've ever had a pulse ox on a emphysema patient, they stay in the 80s sometimes, which is highly abnormal. Um, but it's oxygen, so we can put some oxygen on them. The bad thing is, is when we put oxygen on them and we crank it up, because these COPD patients, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients, or emphysema patients, we don't like to have them on high levels of oxygen. Why? They're usually at two to four liters of oxygen, no higher. Why is that? They're out of breath. Their body. That'll put them in more distress. Because the thing is, is when you crank it up to six or eight liters, now we're flooding them with oxygen. And now what does that do to the oxygen level? So remember, negative feedback, their oxygen level is here. We crank it up to eight, their oxygen level comes up to here. So what does that brain think? You have plenty of oxygen. So what does it tell your respiratory system? Stop breathing, yeah, slow down. You're breathing way too fast. And so they can actually quit breathing doing that. Lots of your COPD patients get into respiratory stress, uh, then call on plenty of active response calls because they've cranked the oxygen up on them. Not good. Okay, get your rubber band. And we're gonna look at the stretch. So just like with the heart, when it gets stretched past what it should be, then we know our blood pressure is high. So it's the same thing here. When, when it gets stretched beyond its capacity, then it starts sending information. Okay, we're breathing deep enough. We don't need to keep breathing so deep. rubber band. So we have stretch receptors in the lungs just like we do in the heart and the vessels.
So what will happen is when they inflate and they stretch out, then we'll say, oh, whoa, whoa, that's enough. Don't stretch anymore. You've stretched enough. So the Herenbrier reflex, so preventing overinflation. So we have stretch receptors in the lungs, preventing over inhalation, over inflating. Named it after the guy that figured it out. And it's a reflex for protection. You don't want to overinflate those air sacs. Really? You think it's a reflex? No, that's first part of it is his name. And oh, it okay. is a reflex. <laughs> so we don't have to think about it. It's for protection. It says, okay, well, well, that's enough. Okay, the next one. <laughs> Emotions, how we can stimulate that limbic system, and we can affect our breathing. So you've had it happen um, with crying or even anxiety. Anxiety, how it increases your respiratory rate. So the limbic system can kick in and cause you to increase the rate and depth as well. And for no good reason sometimes. Yeah, I know. I'm not going to be able to keep all those pretty glasses either. So. So to equal uh, emotions or even anxiety to equal hypothalamus and limbic can cause increase respiration rate and depth system. So we know it can affect our breathing. We get scared, we get angry. Or even hurting, they can affect your respiratory rate. The last person, any type of respiratory irritant, you know you can't hold a sneeze in. You may be able to cycle it, but that's not good. Increasing that pressure can cause rupture of the tympanic membrane. Not a good deal. You're supposed to sneeze. There's a reason for it. It's a reflex. Get whatever those irritants are out. That's the last one. Go back 
that to our oxygen or gas exchange, not just oxygen. I cut off his body. <laughs> I just yeah, you can cut off body. I cut off oh, the line to him and off of his tissue. I will take chocolate. Isn't there a danger of chocolate this time? Yeah, oh, I know. Like, That's hard to turn down, isn't it? So on this one, I said a reflex. So it's a protect. Any reflex, remember, is for protection. So we've had some type of irritant. You know, maybe, I don't know, cigarette smoke, pepper, any type of, or we have some type of pathogen that's even trying to get in. So we're trying to get it out. Yeah. So irritant. Causes a reflex. Thank you. We know a reflex is for protection to get rid of the irritant. So the sneezing or coughing is to get rid of that irritant, get it out. On page 349, and it'll be on on the online. On page 349, make sure you know the definitions. So a tidal volume is just a normal breath in and out. Yeah, 349. Problem is, is these you get them mixed up very easily. They're just plain old definitions, but they're easy to get mixed up. All those that title in school. Yeah, that's in all those different colors there. So, inspiratory reserve volume. So, you take a normal breath, but then you can kind of suck in a little bit more. And the same thing with expiratory reserve volume. So you normal exhalation, and then you can push out just a little bit more at the end. Now residual volume, this is the amount of air that's sitting in the lungs that you cannot get out, even with expiratory reserve volume, even with that last little push of air out. This is to prevent total collapsing of the lungs, kind of holds them open a little bit, just like with a balloon. If you were to blow it up and then let it go down, but not all the way, then it's easy to blow it back up again and just let it go down just a little part of the way, not all the way down. So there's a little bit of air that just remains in the lungs. Vital capacity. So it's a normal breath in and out. And then you add in the little bit of volume <coughs> that you can suck in at the end and you can push out at the end. So vital capacity is all of it. So you can kind of think of vital capacity as like a really deep breath in and a forceful breath out, all of it together. So your total lung capacity is gonna be that, the vital capacity, plus whatever little bit of air that's sitting in the lungs that we cannot move. That residual volume. These don't seem real important, um, but they do become important later on in med surge. You gotta know these terms 
for med surge when we start talking about patients that are on ventilators. as well as when patients are doing pulmonary tests. We've got to know, know these definitions. So do know those definitions, as well as on page 350, you should have already been exposed to these, talking about the different types of breathing that you can have. Should have had that <coughs> fundamentals assessment of respiratory already. Okay, so that brings us to diffusion, our review of diffusion. The picture is on page 341. Now we're going to talk about it on page 352. Oops. So 24 is showing where blood that's already been dropped off at the tissues is coming back to the lungs. <coughs> so they've got a lot of CO2 on them. And now we're going to get rid of it. So 24 is your CO2, your carbon dioxide. We're going to blow it out. So it moves from the cells in the tissue to the blood. And then from the blood to the alveoli. That's how we're going to get rid of it. Moves from the cells into tissue? No. Re moves from the cells in the tissue, so the cells that are inside the tissue itself, into the blood and then into the alveoli, so then we can blow it out. So, 25 is the blood cells that are moving along, so they're unoxygenated on this side. So D, because they just came back from the tissue. So deoxygenated red blood cells. They're carrying CO2, lots of CO2, and even a little O2, but not enough to really help out. So we say they are deoxygenated. We decrease the level of oxygen on them. But do you remember your venous blood does still have a little bit of oxygen on them? Remember how many millions of hemoglobin molecules we have on one red blood cell and how many red blood cells we have. Okay, number 26 is on the other side. So now we've moved from deoxygenated blood, getting rid of its CO2. So now we're going to be picking up oxygenated on this side. So 26 is just showing your oxygen. We're taking a breath in with our oxygen. And it's going to jump on that red blood cell and the hemoglobin. So remember, 
on this side, I have a whole lot of oxygen in this sac. Whereas in the blood, I have very little oxygen. So oxygen likes to go down the gradient, the pressure gradient, concentration gradient, likes to go from an area of high concentration of oxygen to an area of low concentration of oxygen. So oxygen goes from an area which is the alveoli from an area of increase or high increase concentration to an area let me pick another which would be blood now So it goes from an area, which is alveoli, of high concentration, that's the oxygen, to an area, blood, of decreased or low concentration. So oxygen goes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So it goes from the alveoli sac where we have a bunch of oxygen to the blood where we don't have very little. So CO2 does the same thing. CO2 goes from an area of high concentration, the blood that's returning back to the lungs, to an area of low concentration, which is the actual incoming air. So we get rid of it. Gas exchange or diffusion. is now oxygenated, oxygenated blood. So we have RBCs dropped off CO2 and picked up O2. This is oxygenated blood? That's oxygenated blood. Your red blood cells dropped off their CO2 on the other side. So now they picked up O2. Moving along their way back to the tissues and the cells. Remember, we have fluid inside this alveoli sac. You have to have fluid for your particles to dissolve in and to have the fusion. So there is fluid all inside the sac. And then this increases our risk for those hydrogen bonds and collapsing of those sacs. So what is it that we have inside this fluid as well to prevent that, to break up those hydrogen bonds? The fluid lines the alveoli. CO2. 
for exchange. Spouses, pledges and bonds. Bonding. So what do you have to break up those hydrogen bonds? It's a lipoprotein, <coughs> a fat protein. Yes. So, so you need, need a lipoprotein to break bonds. That lipoprotein is surfactant. Oh, that's hard to see. So you need a lipoprotein to break up bonds, and that's surfactant. At what week do we start to produce surfactant in the neonate or in the fetus? At how many weeks do they have a sufficient amount of, or they start to produce it? Twenty-eight weeks. Yeah. 28 weeks. 28 weeks we start to produce surfactant. So that's why if you have a newborn, even at 20, 28 weeks, they may not have a sufficient amount of surfactant. But what will happen is that newborn will come out and they'll take that first breath of, and then you hear nothing else. Why is that? So they'll come out and they'll make a noise. No cry. But you only hear one cry. Why do you not hear a second or a third? Why do they not continue to breathe? Because what happens when they have to take a deep breath to make that cry, so they exhale that cry, now what happens? Because when we exhale, what happens to our alveoli? They come down. And if you don't have surfactant, remember inside that we have all this water lining it. And they're hanging on to each other, bonding, pulling on each other. So when it slaps down, without surfactant, it cannot reinflate Because those bonds are bound. <coughs> so it won't open back up. So then what do they do? You can intubate them and you can try to, but what they'll do is give them endotracheal surfactant. Does this happen a lot? Um, if you have a to where you cannot prevent the preterm labor and it's going to happen, a lot of times we'll give them steroids in preparation if they're going into preterm labor and we can buy out a week or two, we'll give them steroids and we can get them producing because the steroids will cross over, stimulate the baby, and the baby will start to produce, they'll start growing faster. So they'll produce this effect. But if they don't, and say we have an emergent delivery, then yes, we can give them endotracheal surfactant. So that's the reason why they want you to carry up those last couple weeks. Yeah. yeah. Well, the last couple of weeks, they're putting on a lot of brown fat. They're doing a lot of fine, you know, developments. So that's important. But no, 28 weeks is early. Mm -hmm. They're viable at 24 weeks. So, oh, okay. yeah, 28 weeks is not, weeks. remember, you're going 40 weeks uh, full term, 38 yeah. weeks full term. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, the later on is, <coughs> is getting them fattened up. Because you'll notice that they're born early, they're kind of skinny and scrawny looking. They don't have all that fat. So they have a hard time regulating the temperature. And their skin is still kind of see through. It's not yeah. see through. Like, yeah, very thin. There's pictures my husband was born like 28 weeks. And you could like see through him. It was crazy. I noticed the fetuses at the uh, thing we went to, they were more transparent and oh, they got yeah. bigger. Um, the, the biggest one, you could really see everything. Yeah. That was so cool. I'm glad we got to yeah, that. That was cool. Yeah. I like that it was in the middle, because normally it's not in the middle of A and P. Like last year, it was at the end of their program. They were in mental health, so a lot of the A and P was not fresh on their minds. That's a little harder to remember. Okay.
That's it, guys. Um, just make sure you read through your chapter. Um, know the passage of, I would know the passage of air. Like I would know all the structures that would go through. So not only um, knowing the actual labeling the structures, but think about when you take an inhalation, how it'll go through the nasal cavity, through the nasal pharynx, oral pharynx, the laryngeal pharynx, into the trachea, through the vocal cords or the larynx, into the trachea, into the primary bronchi, then the tertiary, this is if I'm taking a breath in, tertiary bronchi, or primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, bronchioles, alveolar ducts, alveoli. That's taking a breath in. Now to get a breath out, you want to know backwards. So know that you would go alveoli through the alveolar ducts, through the bronchioles, through the tertiary bronchi, secondary bronchi, primary bronchi, trachea, larynx, oral pharynx, or lingerial pharynx, oral pharynx, nasal pharynx, nasal cavity, out. So do you know it backwards as well? Because there will, there, sometimes there's uh, those questions on about uh, what structures does it go through on exhalation? You're free for lunch, guys. I'm done with you already. Uh, just make sure you go through and color your structures. I usually like to color them the same as same as the book if you can. Oh, shoot. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, yeah.